This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Welcome back to Beyond the Big Screen. I am very excited to be joined by author Michael Pye to talk about his book, Europe's Babylon, The Rise and Fall of Antwerp's Golden Age. This book discusses the incredible story of the city of Antwerp during the 14 and the 1500s. Michael Pye is the author of incredible books such as The Edge of the World, The Drowning Room, and The Pieces of Berlin. He is a journalist, columnist, and broadcaster based in Amsterdam. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Stephen, it's a pleasure. Now, uh, in your previous book, The Edge of the World, that was a cultural history of the North Sea during late antiquity and into the Middle Ages. And Europe's Babylon is a cultural history of a North Sea port during the early, late Middle Ages, early modern period. What draws you to this um, particular history of this area? Oh, excitement and scandal. It's two things. It's the fact of going back to an era where there was everything to discover, everything to find out. The wonderful things were suddenly coming over the horizon from India or America or Africa, wherever, and where people had to think about them, and where there was just this sense of a bubbling excitement about the world in general. Nobody could find it boring. It was always either challenging or threatening or horrible or perfectly wonderful. And that, to me, is enormously exciting. Yeah. And so uh, can you maybe set the stage a little bit? Where is Antwerp located and why was this particular area so central? Okay, start with the North Sea and start with that space between Britain and France and the Low Countries going up towards Norway. The North Sea was always the sort of sheltered sea off the Atlantic and it was the way into a great deal of Europe. It wasn't all that easy to come up from the Mediterranean, cross the Alps and go down the rivers from there. It was much easier to come round Europe and put yourself into some sort of harbour on the North Sea. And from there, you could send your goods wherever you want. And that's what Antwerp's great virtue was. And the single thing that matters most about Antwerp is mud. Uh, Brugge, the Bruges, the town close to Antwerp, which was almost as powerful at some points in this period, finally got ruined by the fact that its access to the sea silted up It was mud that ruined it. Antwerp, on the other hand, had this incredible river, very powerful tides that were powerful enough to scour it. So you had this protected harbour inland with very easy access from the sea. So if you had caravels coming up from Venice or you've got silver ships coming up from Lisbon that have been to America, uh, you very sensibly landed stuff in Antwerp. I was thinking a, a good place to start with, and it's kind of the deep end of the pool, but I think it kind of, it sets the whole stage here. What were your sources? Was there a lot available in English? Did you have to dig into Dutch sources and kind of giving the end away in the beginning? A lot of, of the sources were destroyed. How easy and or difficult was it to get actual materials to help you write this book? I just had to, to look absolutely everywhere. I mean, I ended up in sort of um, elderly preachers' archives in Zurich and the state archives in Lisbon and the Medici archives in Florence and all the rest of it. Because in the end, if you're a foreigner writing about a a city like Antwerp, it makes sense to to look at what other foreigners made of it in the period. Because guess what? These are the people who had to explain things. If you're constantly reading what people in Antwerp knew about Antwerp, well, they're not going to bother to tell you because they know it. But if you're an ambassador from Venice, was in Antwerp, then you explain things back home. You tell them what the differences are. You tell them what people eat, how they flirt, what life's like on the street and all the rest of it. And that is the stuff that brings it all to life. So it's a, it's a business of looking absolutely everywhere. Can you tell a little bit about this area of Flanders? I know people are probably at least familiar with it in very broad strokes, but it kind of is in the middle of everything, and it's a borderland, but it's also central. It's a very interesting area. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, it's in the middle and on the edge. I mean, it's incredibly complicated history. It only gets simple when the Habsburgs, who are ruling Spain, decide that they will crash into the Netherlands, take over the Spanish Netherlands, so-called, and bring it all together as one area which is under control from Madrid. 
And even that doesn't simplify things terribly because you've still got the Gundian traditions and Brabantine traditions and all the rest of it. So it's it's a curious mixture of a place which is very complicated and very small, relatively speaking, but it's on the edge. It's the access to a lot of Europe, which mattered enormously. And it's also the place through which armies go. Wars pass through Flanders and that area. And to some extent, they still do. Now, Flanders, it's they speak a similar language, Flemish, to the Dutch in the United Provinces, just to the north. What are maybe some of the similarities and differences to maybe set, because there's definitely a big political difference between the two, especially at your at the point set in this in your book? Oh, yeah. Well, nowadays, I mean, the, the, the big difference the Dutch will tell you is that the Flemish don't really speak Dutch. And the big, and the big difference the Flemish say is, you guessed it, the Dutch don't really speak Dutch. Uh, but no, at this, at this point, the difference is who's in control. At this point, everything up to Amsterdam, right up to Groningen, right up to the north of what's now Holland, the Netherlands, um, is, is all under the same control, the same political control. But it works in some places and in other places it doesn't. But it's one unit politically, one incredibly unstable unit. It's, it's like a large number of dogs fighting in a sack. The, 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 Every kind of religious controversy, every kind of political controversy, every kind of sense of identity, all brought together by the Spanish, but um, not exactly held in place. Yeah, I think that that's so interesting. The, uh, I was thinking it's kind of a rough neighborhood. You have the Valois Fran- French there. You have the the Habsburg. You have all these different groups. And Antwerp, like you said, is central to it, but it's also a... it's enough on the periphery that it can kind of get its own culture. Yeah, but also, I mean, the Valois French, the Habsburgs on either side, they needed Antwerp. They needed a place where they could borrow money. They needed a place where they could buy and sell things. They needed a place where they could get arms and the cash to pay the armies who were going to use them. But everything depended on having places which were real market towns. But market towns for empires, not just market towns for buying and selling the odd cabbage and sausage, we're talking about selling everything from the secrets, the politics, who's going to go to war where, to the way and the means to go to war, all of these things, bought and sold there. So it's almost like a political market. What made Antwerp in this period really start to shine and enter this golden period uh, it it started to eclipse some, uh, like you said earlier, some of the other cities like Bruges. What made it so special at this time and place? Well, one simple thing, which actually has to do with the divisions within the Netherlands, um, Antwerp is not in Flanders. Antwerp is in Brabant, technically. Now, this might not matter nowadays, but it did matter then enormously because the rules and regulations were different, because in Flanders, people were manufacturing a great deal. And so they protected their manufacturers, they had guilds, they had really powerful protectionism. But Brabant, no. In Brabant, you could improvise. In Brabant, you could wing it. And that's exactly what Antwerp did. It invented the idea of having a trade fair twice a year, where everybody knew where they should go and on what dates to buy what they wanted. And what they wanted could be anything from pictures to tapestries to horses to armor to wool to anything. Even, even the wine trade went through Antwerp. The, the local wine was said to be particularly disgusting, but the, <laughs> with the trade in other people's wine did go through. So you, they were able to open a market, and then they were able to make their own rules. If you were buying and selling in Antwerp, you didn't even have to unload the goods on the quayside. You could act, the goods could go straight through, off the boat, onto a cart, onto a barge, whatever, and go to wherever they were. So Antwerp becomes a place where deals are done. It's not the place which is buying and selling for itself. It's the center of deals. It becomes the place where you get the first great exchange. It's not a stock exchange, but it's more of a commodities exchange. Uh, but you get the idea of the exchange turned in Antwerp into the most spectacular civic monument. I mean, Antwerp has a truly beautiful, truly magnificent exchange about 30 years before it bothers to rebuild its town hall. That's the real heart of the city. Well, uh, some of the thing, one of the things that I found really interesting is that it seems like Antwerp was one of the very first places where people really started to understand finance and understand what commercial 
enterprises were like when you're saying that people don't have to physically, here's my uh, car full of wool and I have it here at my stall. Do you think that that was one of the main reasons that Antwerp really took off during this period? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I mean, Bruges, Bruges and Antwerp were always great rivals. Because after all, <clears throat> both were functioning as ports, both were in the same area, both had the same advantages of the North Sea and the Rhine, and all the rest of it fine. But when Antwerp had its two yearly fairs, the people in Bruges began to, began to complain no business was done in And what's more, all of the banking things that had been in Bruges before suddenly realized, well, we sort of better have a branch office in Antwerp for the time of the fairs anyway. And they set them up. So bit by bit, the machinery, being a great trading center, got set up in Antwerp. uh, A lot of the bankers from around the southern Europe and the Mediterranean, they started opening up banking houses in Antwerp. Was that what they were being drawn to, is that it was such a vital commercial uh, community? Well, if you think what what banking actually meant at the time, which was not obviously checking accounts, it was not even particularly shifting money from one place to another through a bank. Uh, it was much more to do with the banks being merchant houses as well as being banks. So it was really the place for deals. And when when the, the, the final proof of this comes in the 1540s, when the emperor decrees that all the letters of credit that are what is fueling trade across Europe, the final place where these letters are judged, the final place where they can be cashed, is the exchange at Antwerp, which makes it even more the absolute center of dealing. It seemed too that Antwerp was one of the first places where people really started to understand that different currencies had different values at different times. A Venetian ducat really needed to be traded for a English pound or a Florentine ducat. Well, absolutely. And when people went to war, they had to get currency. And the currency they got was not a kind of banker's draft. You needed the right coins with the right faces on them that would pay the right soldiers in the right territories when you were actually going to start a battle. You had to have all of that first. And also, I mean, Antwerp was one of those places which had a really literal-minded idea of money supply, because the question was, how many coins have actually been shipped into or out of Antwerp? So you also get a situation where one man in Antwerp on the money markets could actually corner the market in money, because money was a physical commodity that had to be shipped about almost as much as it was an abstract idea. And the fascination of Antwerp is that slowly, 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 the idea of the deal, the comparison between deals, this abstract level of money becomes all important, which I think actually is the beginning of a really huge change in our world. How did that idea get carried forward through Antwerp, this idea that all these commercial ideas, because Antwerp fades out of the scene who, who kind of picked up that legacy after Antwerp? Well, people started going, Antwerp after about 55, 56, starts to have for the first time the wars of the Reformation inside the city. I mean, they've been very good at keeping them out before that, but they suddenly, that stopped. So Antwerp was suddenly uneasy. It was even more violent than usual. It was risky. You couldn't do business as well. That started people moving out. Then when in 1585, the Spanish took back Antwerp, which had asserted its independence, which had become a Calvinist republic, absolute anathema to, to the Habsburgs who deeply believed that their authority and God's authority were more or less the same thing. And if you didn't go to mass, and you certainly couldn't be a loyal subject of the Habsburgs, you had had to have a point where all you needed certainty in order to do trading. And that went just literal physical safety. Um, and when the Spanish took back, Antwerp after a long siege in 1585, they allowed the Protestants to leave and one third of the population of Antwerp left in the course of two or three years. They were given a very good deal. They were allowed to take assets with them so they could actually take their business with them. And that is very much the beginning of the golden years of Amsterdam. That's where it all begins. So much comes north from Antwerp. Printing comes north from Antwerp. The idea of a city built around canals, modern canals, first done in Antwerp, then in Amsterdam. I mean, these aren't canals like Venice, which happen to be sort of an accident of geography. Somebody has gone out to build them and build them specifically in order to do business. All of these things migrate to the north. And there's there's an awful phrase about about the the printing business 
in Amsterdam, which is that it was feeding off the corpse of Antwerp. And in a way it was, because when Antwerp stopped being able to make its own rules, then Antwerp was dying. And now, a brief word from our sponsors. Yeah, it's so interesting that um, Antwerp, for for all the for a long time, was a part of the Spanish Empire and the the Habsburgs, but it really wasn't a part. Why did Antwerp, in a, a, such a highly Catholic empire like the Spanish, how were they able to be a safe haven for conversos and Jews and? Uh, different groups that would not have been and were not welcome in Spain proper. Well, I mean, gr- groups that, that that Charles V, the emperor, actually really wanted to annihilate. I mean, this man's diaries, if you go through them, are full of obsessive stuff about getting rid of heretics. Admittedly, he worried more about Lutherans than he did about Jews to begin with, but he, he really was obsessed with the idea of getting rid of heretics. It was possible because the empire was broke. And so were a good many other rulers across Europe, and they needed money. And Antwerp, because it was able to deal at this level of abstraction, was able to finance France almost at the same time as it was financing the empire, even when they were at war. It was able to finance Elizabeth I. I mean, Elizabeth I's military operations, you could not have been done without money from Antwerp. So when you have that kind of dependency, you can't really wreck Antwerp, because that's going to cut off the supply of money. And what Antwerp was, more than anything else, was a town full of heretics. That's what made it possible. If there hadn't been Jews who were running the spice trade from India out of Portugal and then to Antwerp, uh, it would never really have begun. Uh, if, if, you, if you didn't have Lutherans coming in with the metals from South Germany, you know, no business. Um, the Calvinists were a bit more discreet, but heresy was the basis of the town. So you couldn't actually stamp on it. Otherwise, you stamped on the money. Did the Spanish understand that as a practical matter, that if we lean too heavily on Antwerp, that we're going to be in big trouble financially? Or was it just something that sort of evolved? Well, they certainly knew they were dependent on it. There's nowhere else they could go. And you get Charles V in his letters complaining about what one money man or another in Antwerp is doing. Um, He was obviously very closely interested in how things were done. Yeah, of course they knew. I mean, they knew that the cost of money in Antwerp for them was a great deal less than it was in most other parts of their empire. They knew that the money was there. They also knew that they could buy you know, the arms they needed in Antwerp as they couldn't in other places. And all of this, it means that it's, it's a system that people don't necessarily, certainly didn't plan and don't necessarily think about. But it's a very strong system. And the surprising thing is it creates something that, that people sometimes think of as religious tolerance, but in a way it isn't religious tolerance because it doesn't occur to you to deal with people on the basis of religion. Why would you? I mean, I think probably the greatest merchant banking house in in, in Antwerp for a time was the House of Mendes, which, which, which was uh, indeed Spanish and then Portuguese Jews who had come up to Antwerp in the spice business. And the, the House of Mendes has every reason to suppose that, that its main controllers were practicing Jews. And there was lots of evidence of that. But why would you interfere with it? You put over it a sort of layer of, from a Catholic point of view, respectability. I mean, you say that, that, that Mendes can have his own chapel and his own chaplain, and you don't investigate too much whether the chapel was actually a synagogue. Um, you, you insist from time to time that the, the children of the senior people of the Mendes family are christened and baptized, and you take them notionally into Christianity. All of that stuff, the surface stuff, is meticulously observed. But what goes on underneath is completely different. So it's not really tolerance, because you're not saying you can do this openly. But it is, in practical terms, a chance to live your own life. Yeah, it's a really different... It. Tolerance isn't the word. I can't even think of a word that precisely, be, it's not like a First Amendment or something. But the, in practice, they were able to do their own religious practices because they were given a sort of a gray area to exist in. Exactly. And also, I mean, you get extraordinary things. Antwerp is where the first Bibles in English were when they were still illegal in England. And this, you think, is a wonderful, wonderful example of tolerance. And yes, 1525, they pour off the presses for William Tyndale, his New Testament. Great. 
One year later, they're burning the same books in the streets around. It shifts moment by moment, stage by stage. It's not completely reliable. But overall, what Antwerp never wanted was interference with the business. And the businesses were often ideas and medicine and religion and faith and all these things, all tied together. It uh, was... Antwerp, one of the earliest printing centers in Europe, it seemed like it was one of the very earliest that really took commercial printing to a, another level. Well, you could have gone to, I don't know, Vans or, or, or places in Germany. And of course, there was Venice, which was hugely important. And there were presses all over Italy. But it's really the concentration of printing and publishing is absolutely extraordinary. I mean, for everything. You know, business books, language books, and almost 80% of the language books produced in Western Europe during the century were printed and published in Antwerp. So you get a really complicated business. And of course, that feeds itself. If you've got a lot of people who know how to run presses, it becomes easier and easier to print more and more books. If you then decide that you can sell all over Europe instead of just having a limited market, and a lot of people like Crystal Plantain did exactly that. Uh, then you can print all manner of different subjects. And the things that go through Antwerp are not, we think in terms of physical books, and they're very beautiful physical books often. There's the wonderful friezes of official processions and all the rest of it. But it's also what goes through Antwerp as ideas, particularly noticeably ideas about medicine, which get turned upside down. You know, people are rewriting the, 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 the list of available drugs and herbs and medicaments for, for, for dealing with different illnesses. And the ideas of that are coming through Antwerp, sometimes in book form, sometimes in practical doctrine. People knew that there were new things coming from all over the world. Antwerp knew what to do with them. Were people making a lot of money out of book publishing and book trading? Was that one of the major industries in Antwerp? Well, it was a really important industry. I don't know that they were making a lot of money. I mean, almost all, well, one of the problems is that quite a lot of the printers in Antwerp were quite obviously crooks. And so it's rather difficult to work out whether they were actually making money out of this or whether there was some other reason for everything. Um, Plantain built an extraordinary business, but it was a business that could go wrong at any time. In his case, it went wrong because he had the wrong religious ideas or he'd print a book which offended suddenly the Catholic authorities. And then all of a sudden, he wasn't quite the successful man he seemed to be. I don't know if they made money, as I say. I don't even know that that was really what's going on. This was building an engine. And I think they really did think of it as an engine. It was distributing ideas across the world that they knew. It was bringing things in. I mean, Plantain, for example, picked up the rights to an account that had appeared in Lithuania of the court of Ivan the Terrible, translated it and published it again in Antwerp. I mean, it's that kind of, you know, really sounds almost like modern publishing. You know, you, you buy the Lithuanian bestseller and you republish it from Antwerp. It's that kind of engine, that kind of process that I think is absolutely central. Nobody was thinking of stopping and taking out the money. What were some of the uh, other... Well, on other arts that were going on, because this was an, a place where arts flourished as well, especially painting. Oh, absolutely. I mean, well, I, let, let, let's do the unimportant arts first of all. And um, if you wanted small ornamental pillars, because you were building a country house, you had to get them in Antwerp or Mechelen. Uh, if you wanted a tomb and you particularly wanted a fixed number of children and mourners on the side of it, you bought it from Antwerp and it came with a kind of do-it-yourself kit. It was the Ikea of magnificent tombs, you know, uh, and, and you put it together yourself. The speciality for a long time was the, the sculptures that stand behind a Christian altar, um, the retables, and they were a real speciality. And what's more, um, the price of a, of a retable was a very, very high percentage of the price of a ship, an entire ship. So we're talking about enormous amounts of money again. And there was painting, and painting changed in that. And one of the things that happened with painting and happened with music as well was that up to this point, people had thought in terms of painting and music as a service. You know, you either hired your court painter or you went to a painter and said, this is what I want, um, this is how we do it. And you hired him to do it, rather like a craftsman, you know, rather like a plumber, you might nowadays. Not in Antwerp. In Antwerp, people painted and the finished paintings were put on sale. And the client could then choose to buy or not buy, of course, but choosing exactly the sort of pictures wasn't the point. I and mean, art suddenly becomes something 
that you buy and sell like any other commodity. And to some extent, the same thing happens with music, because up to then, you, music as a court service uh, was, was, was something that everybody knew about. I mean, court musicians produced the right music for a death or a birth or a wedding or whatever. Um, now, it was being printed. It was being printed and it was put on the streets. And it was everything from, from dirty songs that Erasmus said should have got their publishers whipped up in the public places um, to, to sacred music that hadn't actually been printed and published. And of course, part of that is to do with the fact that printing's developing like mad and not just in Antwerp. And part of that is to do with shifts. But the shifts in the market are in Antwerp. In the art market, for example, in the course of building the whole new exchange building, the Bourse, uh, in, in, in the 18th and the 16th, well, I'm slipping centuries, in the 1530s, um, the, they suddenly decided to add another floor to the building. And the extra floor to the building is for art. That's in the 1530s. Now, usually we're told that art dealers don't really get started until Amsterdam in the 17th century. Oh, no. There were art dealers in Antwerp long before that, and they were buying and selling. And guess why? Because you've got all of these foreign merchants in town who want to buy pictures. I mean, the, the Medici bought pictures on tapestry to hang alongside the Botticellis, at least in their country houses. Um, these were places where people were used to buying and selling, were enthusiastic about art. And all of a sudden, art was there as a commodity. You know, it's like the Macy's, or I should say the Bloomingdale's, of, 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 of art has opened for the first time. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's fascinating because it really changes the entire paradigm of art. I mean, even at that time in a lot of other places, you, a patron hired an artist, create this art for me, and this is exactly what I want, and that's what they pretty much got, and, and they were beautiful, and they were important. But this is a, a, a whole different way to approach art, that these artists had freedom to express what they wanted to express, and if people wanted it, they could buy it. Well, exactly. I mean, artists had product lines. They had something that they produced again and again in very subtly different forms and at different prices. I mean, you, there's one awful line, and Van Cleef had a line of kissing cherubs, these are possibly the most revolting pictures that have ever been painted. The two enormously fleshy babies who appear to be tonguing each other. Uh, it, it, it's really disagreeable. But they are pictures that were available. And you could have them horizontal or vertical. You could have them finished by the artist or finished by an assistant. You could have them bigger or smaller, whatever. That is just a product line. So the idea of the composition becomes much as, I don't know, let's say glass being mass manufactured, let's say cups and saucers being manufactured. The idea is original, but the production line is something quite different. So did that have a way of democratizing art that somebody could get that latest fashion who was maybe a lower merchant or a craftsman and they could be keep up with the Joneses of having that sort of art in their house? Oh, well, yes, yes. But I, I think they actually thought they were being very holy. Um, there was a great deal of religious art, although that does change. Somewhere about the, the, the 1530s, you start getting rather fewer cherubs and rather more Roman matrons committing suicide, Lucretia usually. Um, now, the point of Lucretia committing suicide, of course, is that she always has to be bare-breasted, so one suspects there may have been more than one reason wanting the picture in the alcoves. But it's, it's the period when people start to bring pictures into their own houses into quite ordinary houses. They're not putting them on the walls of chapels. They're not putting them in some, in some sacred space. And they're not a simple statement. No, they, they want to live with these people. You had mentioned in the book that there was a uh, painter's guild. What did the guild do for these individual artists? Well, it had done various things at different times. It was, very, it was instrumental in selling the work, actually. Um, it managed the markets for a long time. Um, it controlled who could and couldn't sell work in a particular town, which mattered a great deal because, I mean, painting was thought of as a, a craft, a skill, and you wanted somebody who was, as it were, licensed. But the fascinating thing is it, it, it was only, of course, for men. One of the strangest and most wonderful things about Antwerp in this period is one picture, which is now in Switzerland, um, of a woman called Katharina van Hensen. And Katharina was the daughter of a quite famous Antwerp painter. And she painted a picture of herself painting a picture. It's the first known self-portrait of an artist at work, but it's a woman. 
she wasn't supposed to be painting at all. And Katerina went on to sidestep the guilds and get herself hired directly by the, the um, imperial the version of the imperial court in, in Mechelen and produced portraits of women we might not know anything about her. So it was possible to defy the guilds. But even the fact that she had to defy them suggests how powerful they were. And now, a brief word from our sponsors. Now, this was also the time of the Wars of Reformation and the, the, when the Reformation actually begins. How, quick, the, how quickly did it take for the Reformation to hit Antwerp? And how much, what level of conflict? Eventually, the conflict would really get to a fever pitch there. But did, it, did the Reformation hit Antwerp really quickly? No, it was all right. For, it was all right for a surprisingly long time, actually, uh, and it was all right because Antwerp was doing other things. You know what I mean? I mean, it wasn't the main way in which it thought of the world, dividing between Protestant, Catholic, Lutheran, Calvinist, whatever. Um, but it couldn't stay like that forever. It particularly couldn't stay like that forever when Charles V, who was bad enough on heresy as the Habsburg ruler, uh, was succeeded by Philip II, who was atrocious on heresy and was really absolutely determined that it should end. He would not have authority challenged in this work. But until then, they got away with it. And they got away with it because the city looked very, very, very devout. I mean, there were, there were processions of the Holy Sacraments in the street every week. Uh, there, there, there were wonderful services, which all the guilds paid for. It looked impeccable. But if you looked a little bit closer, you noticed a few things like Antwerp always refused to have a bishop. They kept being offered a bishop. And they kept saying, no, 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 we don't think we really need one of those. And the reason they didn't want a bishop was that the bishop would bring in the church machinery. And with the church machinery would come the Inquisition. And with that, inevitably, would come an attack on the heretics that Antwerp was rather carefully protecting. That, that, this really is the time of high Inquisition. And it was really, they were able to insulate themselves from the, the Inquisition, or at least the worst of the Inquisition? For a time, for a time. All of this, I have to say, for a time. While Charles V was on the throne, he wasn't as obsessional about the Inquisition. And in any case, he was distracted by fighting Lutherans left, right and centre across Germany. So that gave Antwerp time to get on with what they wanted to do. But then there comes a point where you just cannot get on with that any longer. And... In Antwerp's case, there was a famous iconoclasm, one night in which the churches of Antwerp were broken, the images were broken, the images on houses were broken. The whole town suddenly looked different. And it was an attack, interestingly enough, only on churches, not on, on, not on the imperial authority. But the imperial authority saw it as an attack on them. And all of a sudden, they try to get rid of the governor they don't quite trust and bring in a really cantankerous, bilious old soldier, the Duke of Alba, and get him to really trample the town in the hopes of really stamping out heresy. They were very lucky, and they did a great deal that was just wonderfully low cunning. I mean, there are moments where, when, when the empire sends people to hunt out the conversos, the converted Jews, uh, what happens for the next 24 hours is like scenes from, I don't know, a Buster Keaton movie. Um, you, know, you, send, you send your great commissioner to hunt out the wicked heretics and you're greeted by the local noble, the Margrave, who says, well, yes, well, unfortunately, I'm not really feeling very well today. Could we possibly talk about it tomorrow? <laughs> you think? And then when tomorrow comes, you go around at six o'clock in the morning and say, well, and you're told, well... <sighs> I mean, do we really have to do all this fussing about it? I mean, it's still dark. People will be alarmed. They won't know what the soldiers are doing on the street. And this goes on and on and on until every single one of the people who was wanted has managed to get out of town. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. But, but it's a sort of thumbing your nose at Ember in a rather discreet and careful and low-key way, which I find enormously attractive. You, know, you don't fire guns at the empire. You just basically make their position too stupid to be tenable. <laughs> that works very well. Eventually, the Calvinists take over and they form the Calvinist Republic. When did that happen? And what, how did that affect the trajectory of Antwerp? Well, it gives it yet another sort of 10-year interlude. Um, it happened towards the end of the period of the, of the Duke of Alba stamping on Antwerp. Uh, there was the moment of the Spanish fury when the Spanish troops, who hadn't been paid, and in many cases hadn't been fed for quite a time, um, turned on the city and burnt it and destroyed large parts of it and destroyed large parts of its records, unfortunately. 
The reaction against that was really quite violent, unsurprisingly. When the Spanish forces went, when their ability to actually control by armed military might went, the Calvinists took over. Why not? They, were, they had been growing in Antwerp for 20, 30 years, or more and more of them. They'd learned to be discreet when they weren't, when they weren't openly attacked. Well, when they were watching their, their, their wives and their children and their brothers diving to their death off the walls and to the moats, having been pushed there by the Spanish troops, the time for being remotely patient with Spanish authority was over. And remember, too, it's also the time when the general revolt against Spanish authority that eventually produces the Netherlands that we know today and the division between the Netherlands and Belgium that we know them today. Um, all of this was happening at the same time. So... All of a sudden, you could, again, make another set of choices. And the Calvinists did, and they weren't enormously more tolerant than the Catholics had been before them. Um, they did some fairly unpleasant things. Uh, one was to go and shout dirty words at the nuns because they thought that would convince them that they didn't want to be celibate anymore. <laughs> Just annoyed them, of course. <laughs> That's <laughs> what else would it do? Um, you get a moment where the whole style of Antwerp changes, um, the physical layout of the place, where the buildings were, how they fitted together. All of that had been a sort of series of, in some cases, wonderful accidents. The Calvinists wanted town planning, and they began to think about straight streets because they were good for the town, and they began to think about beautiful streets and handsome buildings. So a lot of the fabric of Antwerp changes during the Calvinist Republic. And, of course, Protestants had a safe place to be. After the Calvinists take over, did, how did they change the, the fabric of the city in uh, as far as the commercial aspects? Well, by this point, the commercial aspects are really problematic. I mean, remember, everybody knew that the way to sort of shut down Antwerp was to block the mouth of the River Skelt. And if you could do that, then Antwerp was ruined. I mean, it, it was a very, very simple device. And a large number of people on different sides did it at different times. I mean, physically, the Calvinists changed the city because, of course, Calvinists are not going to approve of convents and monasteries and so forth. And convents and monasteries tended to have ground. So those grounds were taken and new streets, new buildings were driven through what had been convent and monastery grounds. So that, again, it's the first time there's been open space used in Antwerp because open space was at such a premium up to then. So that's the physical change. In commercial terms, well, commercial terms were not good at all. Um, this is a, a city which was literally under siege for two or three years before it fell to the Spanish again. But it had been pretty much under siege in terms of trading. And remember how complicated it is actually to, sh to move a cart full of stuff from one place to another across bad roads, how long it takes, how long it takes even to get a barge of stuff up a river like the Rhine. Um, you haven't you, you haven't got the luxury of things moving fast, and since that's going to happen, you don't have the chance of moving them efficiently. And if the weather turns against you, if there are armies to the left and to the right, if you're not sure whether you're going to be attacked if you take one route or the other, all of that begins to to, to shut down the commerce of Antwerp. There's so many interesting characters and people and families in this story. Are there any ones that particularly stood out to you or that kind of along your process became your favorites? Oh, the great Donna Gracia. Absolutely extraordinary woman. I mean, you've got to think of women's position was not very brilliant. It was better in Flanders than it was almost anywhere else, but um, it was not very brilliant. But here's a woman who becomes the head of the largest merchant banking operation in Europe. And she gets there, well, she gets there by family connections, but rather an interesting kind of family connections. Her husband dies and leaves her half the business on condition that she runs it. And then his brother dies and leaves the other half of the business to her on condition that she runs it. In other words, they had deep faith in this woman being able to do exactly what no other woman was being allowed to do. And she does a phenomenal job. She, 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 she sent, she goes to Lyon to get money from the French king, which has been owed to the House of Mendes for a very long time. And she gets it. Lord knows how, whether it was simple intimidation or she just looked rather fierce and, and, and the, what the methods were, who knows? But she talked him into paying. She was able to do deals at that level. She could see down kings. And at the same time, she was running the most remarkable kind of underground railroad because the Inquisition had just come into Portugal which is where the Mendes family to which John Gracia belonged came from. Um, so Jews were immediately at threat, uh, under immediate threat 
They were told not to leave the country. They could not take any assets out of the country under any circumstances. They were trapped. So there had to be a kind of underground railroad to get people out of Portugal, to get them safely, usually to England, actually, because you had to wait a bit to take them to Antwerp. It all rather depended on whether Charles V was hysterical about heretics at that particular day. And then to get them out of Antwerp by this, by this really detailed route, which we know about, up the Rhine, across the Alps, and down the other side to the couple of Italian states, which were prepared to give safe harbour to Jews, and usually, eventually, to Istanbul and to the Ottomans, who did not have quite the same Christian attitude. This woman is doing all of this. She's organising the biggest merchant banking operation in Europe. She's doing it successfully. She's seeing off kings who owe her money. And she's also saving large numbers of people and getting them to safety on the other side of Europe. Absolutely phenomenal person. Yeah, it really is amazing that somebody in that, a woman, especially at that time period, could organize such an amazing uh, organization of moving people from Portugal to England to Antwerp, and then all the way to Greece and modern modern day Greece and Turkey. I mean, the logistics of that would be at least challenging today to do it in, and to have to do it in secret, no less. <laughs> Phenomenal. But, um, I don't know that Donna Gracia knew all the details, but, but, but certainly we've got papers which show all the details, and they, they're down to this kind of detail. Um, when you're crossing the Alps, if you're traveling with your wife and you want to travel with your wife, make sure that you both have horses from the same farm, because horses like to travel as a family too. Uh, <laughs> it's that kind <laughs> of detail that people are worrying about. Um, no, I mean, it, it's true that... that the, the, men, the House of Mendes, the roots of its power were in Portugal, um, where, of course, theoretically, there were no Jews. Um, but the Portuguese crown needed somebody who could run the spice business efficiently. And they got that with the Mendes, both in Lisbon and in Antwerp. And on the basis of that, of course, you've got a phenomenal range of international contacts. And you also got infinite credit because you are thought of as the people who, who virtually control the spice trade. India. Come on. I mean, these are not people you're going to argue with about money or a bill of credit. And they also had the mechanics of buying and selling spices, which meant that they could use the same bits of paper for quite different purposes, you know, to make sure that people could get their assets, their goods out of Portugal and take them with them. Another fascinating character that I've stumbled across a, a few times, and I didn't know his connection to Antwerp was Erasmus. He's such an interesting person because he was able to walk the knife's edge between the Protestants and the Catholics and really survive it. Uh, what was his relationship with, with Antwerp? Well, his banker was in Antwerp. And there are wonderful letters. His, his banker was constantly trying to teach Erasmus about money. Now, you or I would probably not dare to try to teach Erasmus about anything. We would assume we knew more. But uh, in fact, he didn't know more about money. And it, it's fascinating because you get Schertz, his banker, trying to explain the abstract idea of Erasmus. You can't grasp it at all. And you realize how extraordinary the Antwerp mentality must have become if even Erasmus couldn't quite manage to understand you know, that money, money changed values when it crossed frontiers, that it could be worth different things at different times, all of that. He was also, I mean, he had, he was part of the, there was a great sort of humanist, to use the usual word, network across Western Europe. People who were scholars, who were interested in Latin texts, who were interested in philosophy in the most general sense, um, and in thinking about the world. And he was extraordinarily important in that circuit. And so were people in Antwerp. So you have Erasmus visiting Antwerp to see the people that he knows who are part of that same circuit. I think a good way to wrap up today, because I, I mean, it's fascinating and I've learned so much. And I think that um, as people read this book, it's they're going, their minds are going to be open to so many different avenues. But what's maybe the legacy of Antwerp today? What should, I mean, Antwerp's still a city today, but uh, what was maybe the, what's the spirit of Antwerp that carries on to today? Well, if you are talking about a picture, by Van, say that's say Van Gogh for arbitrary choice. Um, what do you think of first? Do you think of how much it sold for at Christie's last year? Or do you think about the impasto and the composition? I would bet you that most people at some point will think about the price it fetched at Christie's last year. And the notion of actually valuing things in money terms, not in moral terms, not in religious terms, um, not in aesthetic terms, 
but mainly in money terms and thinking that is the value of things, is the bad side of, of, of what Antwerp did. But on the other hand, by going to that level of abstract deals, Antwerp gave us the beginnings of all the machinery for making the rich world of which we live richly nowadays, so one can hardly complain. The other thing, if you want propaganda, and I'll give you cheap propaganda in quantity, you can have a situation where you don't divide things unless you absolutely have to. So you have a merchant class who are also scholars. You don't have merchants and scholars looking down on each other. You have Protestants and Catholics working alongside, not making a point of emphasizing the divisions. You have Jews doing business with South German merchants uh, whom would probably disapprove of them in many ways, but don't because there isn't any point because there's another system which is strong enough to make things work. And I wonder whether we don't need now to look for some kind of system that makes us makes our decent behavior and our proper relations one with another work. Thank you again for listening to the Beyond the Big Screen podcast. A huge thanks goes to our special guest, Michael Pye, author of Europe's Babylon, The Rise and Fall of Antwerp's Golden Age. Links to learn how to find Michael Pye's book can be found in the show notes. A great way to support Beyond the Big Screen is to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. These ratings and review really help me know what you're thinking about the show and help other people learn about Beyond the Big Screen. You can also learn more about Beyond the Big Screen and movies you like to watch and stories so great that they should be movies on Facebook and Twitter by searching for A2Z History. You can contact me there or just send me a good old-fashioned email to my email address, steve at a2zhistorypage.com. Links to all of this and more can be found at beyondthebigscreen.com. I will see you next time beyond the big screen.